All right, so if you guys are here for configuration management and true life story, you're in the right spot. That's awesome. We're happy to have you. If you're not in the right spot, stay. You're going to learn something. Okay. Um, I want to start off with a, question, a couple questions. How many of you are using configuration management right now? Okay, cool. How many of you are not and are hoping to learn something from this that will be like, oh my god, I need to use this? Okay, so good, because if you already are using it, you may learn a couple of new things that you can do. If you are trying to figure out if you need to use it, I mean, the short answer is yes, but hopefully we convince you further. So yeah, I um, want to talk about how we arrived to the name of this presentation, it being a true life story. So two and a half years ago, um, John and I were working on a couple enterprise projects together, and our teams were kind of in a transition from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. And we weren't really taking advantage of the configuration management system in core. Uh, what we were doing was kind of still what we did in Drupal 7, which is you do all your configuration in Drupal, and you pull down, and everybody shares databases. Um, we learned very quickly that there was a problem with that because if somebody was in production making a change and we were pulling it down, John may overwrite a change that I'm doing incidentally. Uh, and there's not visibility through code review or anything uh, that allows anybody else to see it other than what you change in Drupal. So um, in the past two and a half years of John and I working together on different projects, this is how we arrived to this type of workflow in config management. Now there's different ways to approach configuration management in Drupal. This is just how we made it work for us because it's not perfect. So, yeah. Yeah, you can, you can very easily roll your own, so keep that in mind. Uh, but first, let's get through the formal stuff. Um, I'm John Picosi. I'm the senior Drupal architect at Oomph. I'm a co-organizer of this fine uh, camp. I'm also a co-podcaster on the uh, Talking Drupal podcast. A uh, little bit about Oomph. Uh, Oomph is a uh, full-service web agency here in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, we're working on complex integrations with uh, Drupal, uh, focusing on commerce, multilingual, accessibility. Uh, some of our clients include Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, Leica Geosystems, uh, and right here in Providence, uh, Lifespan. So I'm Nathan. Um, I work at Chromatic. Uh, we're a distributed uh, Drupal agency across Eastern Europe all the way to the West Coast of the United States. Uh, we work with pretty big brands, uh, mostly uh, media uh, companies and publishing companies. Um, I work there as a PHP application developer, uh, doing back-end development, site building, DevOps, front-end, pretty much everything. Um, I'm also the co-organizer of Drupal Providence. We're a local meetup in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, John is my co-organizer. Um, if you do live in this area or want to come check us out, we do monthly meetups on the third Tuesday of every month. Um, and we're also looking for some sponsors for 2019, um, as well as uh, I just got my Grandmaster certification for Blade this year. So um, that's a pretty cool accomplishment. Nice work. Thanks. So what is configuration? Let's start, let's start with the basics, right? Uh, if you look at the Drupal documentation, uh, it says configuration. In Drupal, configuration is the collection of admin settings that determine how the site functions as opposed to the content of the site. Which is like, what does that mean, right? Well, that's good. We have a slide for that. So what this slide is, uh, is illustrating here is the difference between configuration and content in Drupal 8. Uh, so you'll notice on the left-hand side there, we have our configuration. On the right-hand side, we have uh, our what's considered content. Uh, first one, content type, right? Anything that goes into your content type is configuration. Anything that goes into a node as content, text, images, so on and so forth, content. Taxonomy vocabulary, configuration. Taxonomy terms, content. You're going to start seeing a theme here as I go through this list, right? Menu. Configuration, menu items or menu links, content. Blocks, blocks are a little bit special, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But block configuration is configuration. Block content is content, which is kind of tricky because when you export a block, you get the configuration and you're like, oh, my block's all set. When I go to my new site, I'm going <coughs> to import my config and my block's going to be there. Not really. It's going to, uh, 
basically the configuration is going to be there, but you're going to have a bunch of messages on your site that are like, hey, this block has no content. And you're going to go, what's wrong? What did I do wrong? Um, at Oomph, we're actually using the recreate block content module to kind of help with this. It doesn't fix it. But what it does is when you, could, when you do a config import, it will actually, after a cache clear, it will recreate the blocks for you. So that way you don't have those messages that say, hey, your block doesn't have any content. It'll just be a blank block. You'll still have to copy the content from one site to another, or your dev site to another, but it kind of fixes the problem. The last one here is media types. Your media types are configuration. Your actual media items, your files, your images um, are content. So this really only, only works if you follow actually what Pantheon has described as their recommended development workflow. Pantheon says, all content should go down, meaning all content should come from your highest environment and go to your lowest environment, and all configuration or code should go from your lowest environment to your highest. And as John said, blocks are probably the most notable thing that, that this workflow has, like you have to follow this type of workflow. Regardless if you're on Pantheon, Acquia, or any other type of, of you know, LAMP stack or, or a host, um, you have to follow this when it comes to configuration management when you're referencing content. Uh, because your config will just reference a, a entity ID that just does not exist on prod or an incorrect entity ID. Uh, and when I say an entity ID, an entity in Drupal is a node, uh, a taxonomy, uh, a menu item, uh, stuff like that. Um, now, the people here, a quick question, that are doing configuration management uh, in your day to day, do you follow this type of workflow or, or do you do something not? I see some nodding heads, yeah. So yeah, I mean, this is really this is really the best practice. As Nate said, you always want content down, config up. So here we have a few more uh, types of configuration. You have fields, views are all config, um, display modes, image styles, uh, your system settings, user roles, language with multilingual. You get a ton, and I mean a ton, of config, and it ha usually happens every time you install a module. So. If you're doing config management, you're doing multilingual, you notice a bunch of config, you're not necessarily doing something wrong, it's just the way, the way it is. Um, and module settings are, are config. So each module can have config that comes along with it. Um, you know, you install, uh, what did I install recently? Google Analytics, right? Google Analytics has config. Uh, so their modules, they have config. So where's configuration stored? And this is a really important part of a good config workflow. Um, John, if you want to hit the next slide. I do. So there's two types of configuration that, that you know, I think the Drupal community and, and John and I really like to classify, which is the difference between active configuration and staged configuration. So your active configuration is going to be what's actually live in your site. That's going to be what's going to be stored inside of a relational database that's supported by Drupal. Um, and it's going to be applied immediately when you have either import that configuration into that environment or when you actually make the change uh, for the UI in that, that environment. Uh, some of the benefits that, that Drupal.org lists is one, performance, because obviously your relational database is, is much more performant than a file system in most cases, um, and then security. Uh, and when they talk about security, they talk about the, the aspect of when you export a, a config file, um, it's going to have a UUID attached to it, which is a unique identifier to that piece of configuration. And then there also will be a site UUID that's in your site configuration. That's specific to your site and doesn't allow you to import your config errantly into another site. Um, so, um, so stage configuration. So this, this type of configuration is actually what you're exporting out of Drupal. It's being exported into YAML files. Um, I'm sure everybody who's been working in Drupal has love or hate it. You're working in YAML regardless. Um, I love YAML, much prettier than JSON. Uh, these types of, uh, this type of configuration, again, it's, it's, it's staged, lives in your file system, and it's, changes are only applied in import or export, uh, meaning that you, know, you have to import your, your YAML files into Drupal to make that change, uh, and vice versa. You want to see that change in your version control, you need to export them from Drupal into the YAML files. Uh, benefits here, portability, meaning that I can package up my YAML files that I can either export through Drupal, I can also download them as a zip file to the UI, 
Um, and again, security. The same aspects of active config, you still get those UUIDs in the, those YAML files as well as the, the site UUID. Yeah. All right, so we're going to talk about what comes out of core when uh, managing config and the configuration manager. So right here is a picture of uh, core configuration management. When you enable config management in, uh, in core, you get a screen that looks like this. And basically the screen tells you, as you can see up at the top there, what's new in your config, what's changed in your config. If you scroll down, you would see what's been removed in your config. Um, it also allows you to do an import and an export. Uh, as you can see right at the top there, there are little tabs, import, export. Those import, export tabs let you do a uh, bulk import and a single item import as well as a bulk export, uh, single item export. Um, but you can also use Drush. Drush users in the, the audience, right? Uh, there are Drush commands. Um, Drush config export, Drush config import. So you can run you can run your imports and your exports right from the command line. Keep in mind though, you're doing doing everything. There's no there's no uh, single single method for it. So uh, this last note here, uh, the configuration manager module actually will install configuration from modules, profiles, and themes, uh, and those actually live in a config directory. And then inside of that config directory, you have a required or optional directory. And the important thing to know about this when you're a module author, whether you're doing contributed or you're actually doing this for a client site, is that required configuration will always be installed when you actually install your module. Great, right? Think about what happens if, for whatever reason, another module author or another person on your site has the same exact configuration ID or key in your database already. It's going to fail on the module installed. So we have this option of a optional configuration. The optional configuration inside the module theme or profile uh, will install the configuration if it doesn't exist. And if it does, they'll skip over it. And you won't have that, that fatal error or that error when you're actually installing uh, that extension. So one last thing about the, the admin here. You're looking at your config and you're like, hey, I got something new, I got something changed. What's changed though? How do I know, right? So you have this nice little view differences button right here. And basically what that does is it gives you a screen like this that lets you know for each one of those config files, it's basically like a diff, right? If you've ever done a diff in Git, um, it lets you know, hey, in this one, I actually have uh, installed commerce price list, it looks like. Um, so this is again what we're talking about here with the, the active config. This is what's in your database right now on your site versus the staged config. This is what's in your um, YAML files, right? So on this screen, if we were to do uh, import here, we would actually uh, uninstall price, the priceless module. Um, if we were to do an export, we would add the priceless module to our, uh, to our config. So the next screen here is kind of the workflow for uh, core configuration management. And the core configuration management workflow is pretty linear, right? You can go from your local environment to a dev environment, to a stage environment, to a prod environment. Um, and that means that every, the whole site shares a common configuration. Uh, this is great for smaller sites that don't, don't have a lot of people working on it or um, relatively simple sites, but it's not a great solution for larger sites, larger companies, because there are a lot of people working on different things. They may need different configuration values in dev and stage than they do in their production uh, instance. So you know, keep that in mind. One of, the, one of the benefits of configuration is that you're exporting all of your, your, you know, your configuration values like uh, you know, settings, API keys. You may want some differences there. So we're gonna talk about how you can achieve that um, in the next slide. So in comes configuration split. So we discovered this after realizing the flaw of the core module. And because we're working with enterprise clients, we have about eight plus team members as well as our clients in there, as well as, I don't know, up to eight different environments probably that we need different configuration values for and, you know, maybe I don't want my Fastly CDN running in my local environment. So uh, config 
if you want to hit the yeah, next slide. Yeah, yeah. Configuration <laughs> split uh, is a contributed module and allows you to actually take that common set of configuration that is sitting in that, that configuration manager workflow, allows you to split it out. So I can say that I can have environment specific splits for local, dev, UAT, production, um, or you can even say like, I only want splits for certain features on my site and say I want a CDN feature, I want a uh, caching feature turned on. Um, so like the configuration manager module, all of this can be handled through the UI or through Rush. And this module actually extends a core configuration manager. Um, and it, it works somewhat seamlessly. Um, so the big benefit, like I said, is that you can enable and disable modules per environment or per feature, uh, as well as themes. Um, and one thing that comes to mind is like the environment indicator module, and if you guys have used that, where like the, the, the admin toolbar changes different colors, fix what's perfect for this. So you can change that color, you can change the configuration values per environment. Yeah, I actually like to tag, like change the site name a little bit for each environment. So like in parentheses on my local, it says local, and then the site name, or dev, and then the site name stage, and then the site name. Um, here, you can also uh, set your active um, splits through settings.php, which, you know, if you're in the command line, it's a lot easier to go do the settings.php configuration than it is to try to go through the UI every time. One thing, one cat gotcha there is you want to make sure you clear cache. So update settings.php, clear the cache, then do your config import. Yeah. Um, oh, you go back? Oh, going back. Sorry. So there's two, there's two things with config split that when I first learned config split, actually last year here at NetCamp, um, these old concepts are floating around with this blacklist and gray list. Um, and the documentation for config split could probably be improved. Um, you know, if you mess around with this and you learn something, it's always contribute back to the module for documentation. Um, but the blacklist is going to be your complete split. That complete split's going to be, hey, I want to completely split all the develop config. Because I only want develop to run in my local environment. So I can say for the local split, I want a, a blacklist for develop. What that will do is when you have the local split enabled, you export config, all of the develop settings will come out and will go into that directory, which we'll show on the next slide, um, where that configuration is stored. Uh, for a gray list or conditional split, you can say I want individual configuration items. So just like those individual configuration items that you can export to the UI, you can see those, that list of those individual items in the UI and you can select them. So, Next slide we're going to show is about um, workflow, right? So keep in mind, remember the core workflow, very linear, common config from one environment to another to another. Well, with config split, you have the ability to have a common config, and this common config applies to all of your, all of your splits, all of your environments. But then individually, you can say, I have a local config, I have a dev config, I have a stage config, I have a prod config. Um, one of the things that uh, we found is that on some, in, in some projects uh, for something like Google Analytics, right, uh, you want to do testing on the dev environment uh, with Google Analytics, uh, and then you want your production uh, ID in, in your production environment. So we, we split that. We split the config. So production ID is for the production environment, and then dev ID is for the dev environment. Works great. Um, there are a number of different ways you can do this. Another one is um, performance, right? You definitely want your site to be, uh, you know, compressing all of your styles and all that, all that stuff in production, but it's kind of annoying in development on your local. You can create splits for that as well. How many config another split, or it lives outside of it, it? So we'll actually show right here the folder structure. So you can see that right here we're showing the common config folder that contains again all your YAML files that are common to each split, and then each split has its own set of config that is specific for that split. So you can see in this one, um, you can see system performance, system site is uh, is changed in development. Um, and in local, and then on production, you can see I actually only have Google Analytics enabled for production and uh, XML sitemap for production as well. Um, so that's just a kind of a sample of what, uh, how you can split out uh, different types of uh, config. So just to, just to be clear though, is in the configuration manager workflow that some of you may be used to, uh, core calls at the sync directory. Um, in in our, our context here, Common is our sync directory. And then the splits 
development, local production, staging, we created those. You can name those whatever you want. It, 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 these are not defined by the module. The module is completely flexible. You can call your splits whatever you want. This is the workflow that John and I uh, have done. Yeah, as Nate said, uh, you know, if you have like eight different environments, those could all be your environment. You know, web server one, web server two, web server three. So yeah, I mean, you can go, you can go crazy. So here's an example of a complete split. Uh, this is right from the Drupal UI. Um, you can see here that for a complete split, we're actually uh, splitting backup and migrate. So we install backup and migrate on our uh, staging and development server so that our dev team can easily grab a database back, uh, copy if they need to. But on production, we don't want that. So what the complete split is doing here is it's saying, only on this environment, install this module. It actually gets added to the YAML file for the split under uh, dependencies area. So when you're doing, uh, you know, doing a PR or reviewing your code, you can actually see it right in there. Same thing for conditional split. So here you can see uh, commerce AVA tax is uh, something that we're doing conditionally. We're splitting to have a different API key in uh, development staging than we do on the production side. Configuration read only. So this module is awesome. And the reason I say that is because once you get configuration on a production environment without, without this module, somebody could go in and change a setting or say, oh, I don't you know, not really know about configuration management and go, oh, I need to update this, I'm gonna update it. Next deployment, that change is gone. And then the person's like, well, I don't know, I keep making this change, I make it like every week, and every week it just disappears. All been there, right? <laughs> this module alleviates that. Basically, what it does is it makes the configuration read only. It adds this nice little message to the top of anything that's considered configuration that says, hey, we're not going to let you make this change, but if somehow you figure out how to do it, it's not going to be saved. So contact your dev team, have them do it the way that they should be doing it to be preserved. This is really good uh, job security for us developers to <laughs> do. Uh, the last thing that we want to do is, uh, I guess, hand over the keys entirely if we want to at least have a retainer on something. Um, the second thing is, there's a huge caveat to this module, is you need to have a solid continuous integration pipeline in place because this is not forgiving. How many of us have deployed some bad config and had a cowboy code that stuff to get that site back working before your client realized you took down their site, right? <laughs> not forgiving. This will not allow you to make changes in the UI. Uh, you can make changes, uh, override this, and use configuration importing uh, with Drush. Um, but unless, again, unless you have a solid CI plan in place, you're familiar with the command line to actually make configuration changes with Drush uh, using some complex Drush commands, uh, I guess uh, you're gonna have a bad time. Um, so make sure that, you know, we'll get into this, this is the last part of the slide, since this is a DevOps themed uh, camp. We're gonna talk about some DevOps and how we integrate config with that. Um, but uh, yeah, just be forewarned, make sure you, you talk to your team and everybody's on the same page of how dangerous that this could actually be if you guys regularly deploy and then make fixes in production. So we got a few minutes, I'll tell you, I'll tell you <coughs> what I think to be a funny story. Um, Last week, I was actually uh, working on some configuration, and uh, I went into the production split locally on my machine, and I'm like, oh, I gotta change this config, and it's only supposed to be in production, so let me go do that. I go to the page, and I'm like, I can't edit anything here, and there's this big message at the top of the page saying like, hey dude, you're in the production split, you can't edit this stuff. And I'm like, oh, man, all right, so if you go to the, configuration read only page, it tells you that there are values you can put in your settings.php file locally, or your local settings file, that will allow you to bypass configuration read only. So you're not, locally you're not 100% walled off, which is which is helpful if you're, you gotta make a, a change to a split. So configuration installer. I'm curious to know who's even used this before. It's a profiling core, has anybody used this? No. Oh, yes. Nice. So configuration installer is a contributed profile. I'd say at this point, uh, probably deprecated, but so I kept it because personally I haven't been able to get uh, the core uh, configuration installer to work with Drush. It works with Drush 9.4. There you go. That'd be, that would be my problem. So Probably not documented. 
So uh, as Adam just said, if you didn't hear, so uh, this is a contributor profile that was merged into Core actually a couple months ago. Um, and uh, just in Drush 9.4 does this actually work. Um, so if you're not using Drush 9.4, the latest version of Drush, you will have to use this profile. So that's a, a, why uh, we kept it on here. Um, but what it does is it allows you to install a brand new instance of Drupal from an existing set of, set of configuration. So we talked about the security benefits of, of config management in Drupal. One of that being that site UUID that doesn't allow you to install config into another site. This allowed you to do that. Um, now we talked about using config split. This, uh, this profile actually doesn't work uh, with config split, meaning that if you do your site uh, install, um, unless you have default values in your common split, uh, it actually won't work. As well as uh, any values that are actually in the split that you define in your settings.php file in the environment that you're running this in, um, it won't actually import. What you have to do is after the site is installed with config installer, uh, you have to clear cache and then import uh, config for Drush or for the UI uh, to get that split uh, config in. Um, you can check this out. Uh, it's uh, on this project, it's made by Alex Potts. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's actually, I believe, one of the maintainers uh, for Core for configuration management. Uh, and if you have any questions about config management after this that relates to something that maybe John and I don't know, you can find him on the Drupal Slack. And he's super helpful. So, again, we're at a DevOps talk, uh, DevOps camp this year, uh, and it's really hard not to talk about DevOps or CI, CD uh, at this at this camp. So. Um, this past year, um, I personally tried to develop some type of uh, testing suite or, or CI suite that allows me to integrate Drupal's config system into my CI pipeline because other than that, there's really just no like linting tool or testing tool for config. The only test we really have is like that human eye to say, hey, like uh, I need to install this to make sure the site's just not broken. Um, so we're gonna discuss how we can automate that a little bit and how that kind of plays into the overall best practices for what we believe uh, is configuration, uh, sorry, continuous integration in Drupal. So, you know, let's just talk about what is CI. Uh, that's the process of automating the build and testing of code in a shared repository. Um, as you can see here, we have defined four aspects of a good CI pipeline. That is your code, your repository, your test and build phase, and your website. Uh, for repository and for test and build, we're going to talk about GitHub and Travis CI, uh, which are, I guess, mutual applications of each other. They only really work with each other. Uh, developers can focus on uh, code and less on environment management, meaning that, you know, as a senior developer on my team, the last thing I want is for my developers to be stressed or scared about making a change in my project. I, I want to have the, the lowest overhead possible for them just to get into my project and to, to get work done. Uh, a good CI pipeline, a good CI workflow allows, allows for that. Um, and likewise, developers can confidently merge code changes uh, to a project while working on a team. Excellent. Thank you. So let's talk about code real quick. So developers can use the configuration manager module that we talked about that they can export uh, Drupal configuration to version control. Version control being Git, SVN. Hope you're not using SVN, just use Git. Um, and you can easily share configuration files between another team member. This is great because uh, I worked on a project that had a gigabyte plus date production database and try to pass that to each other without airdrop, uh, impossible. A uh, lot, of, lot of floppy disks. <laughs> <laughs> So config management is great because I can export my config, I can push it up to a feature branch and say, hey John, branch off my feature branch and take my config. And we didn't have to pass around a database. Uh, then the developers can use the configuration split model that we talked about to test different uh, configuration changes locally. As John said, you can switch out the type of split that you want in your settings uh, file in your local environment. So I can switch my split to prod, import the prod config locally and make sure my site doesn't blow up locally before I push it to prod. Uh, and lastly, uh, I can't talk about uh, CI without saying that you should really be using syntax validators uh, that are either executed with uh, Git hooks or manually invoked uh, in your local development environment. Um, takes a lot of uh, byte shedding out of the next 
uh, section we're going to talk about, which is the code review process. Uh, make, make sure that your team members are fighting with the computer and not themselves. So that's a, that's a super good <laughs> recommendation. Uh, so the next one we'll talk about the repository. Uh, so when your developers have, or yourself have, made your config changes and you've committed your code, you're going to push up to a repository, post it at GitHub, which is probably my favorite. Uh, your developer should create pull requests. Um, who here does code review at their company or on their teams? Hopefully after this camp, everybody will raise their hand uh, because I'm pretty sure everybody's going to talk about code reviews, uh, automation, stuff like that today. Um, so developers on my team at Bromatic, at John's team at Oomph, we do pull requests for every change we make, not one change enters production without a code review, another set of eyes seeing it. Um, this allows you know, your team members to catch errors that they make, or bias, or spelling errors sometimes. The last thing you want is a spelling error going into production. Uh, in uh, the CI pipeline in GitHub at Oomph and Chromatic, we have automated builds and tests that are triggered uh, when a new commit is pushed to a branch. Uh, that status of that build um, is then posted on that GitHub pull request so that uh, it prevents the merge of that code to that default branch or that master branch unless those automated tests have passed as well as a code review has approved that change. Um, next slide. The test and build phase. So, super important, which is something that uh, I personally in the past year just started ramping myself up on using Travis CI. Uh, and that is to use a service like Travis to run code syntax validators that not only ran locally, but now in the CI process, automated tests, uh, and then handles your deployments in the same CI pipeline. Um, configuration installer works super well in this step. And the reason why I'm saying that is it's twofold for me, personally. The first thing that I love about using config installer profile in my CI pipelines is that it's going to install a brand new instance of Drupal and it's going to test, it's going to autom automate testing your configuration. If you have a dependency mismatch, if you have content missing that's referencing this config, hopefully it is caught in this step automatically. It's not 100% foolproof, but for me, this has worked really well to prevent bad config going into production. Uh, lastly, is that you can use the config installer to install a brand new instance of Drupal into that CI environment, and then you can not only do that, but then you can use the bell generate, generate content, and then run your functional tests against this environment without actually pulling a production database into your CI environment. Super important uh, for myself and John, who've worked with healthcare providers who have serious security and HIPAA uh, constraints that we just can't easily pull a database from production that's gigabytes big and then uh, run these tests. We could do that. We could sanitize that database, but it's probably going to take an hour to run the CI test, and that's, again, friction and overhead, not what you want. Uh, and then lastly, um, in this build phase, if anything fails, it's going to halt the pipeline, and it's going to post that result, like I said, back on the GitHub, and uh, it'll tell you exactly what you need to do to fix it. Travis, Travis has saved me from posting bad config numerous times where it's like, oh, we're going to go ahead and build this. And it's like, oh, you know what? Hey, you removed the module from the composer JSON file before we actually uninstalled the config from the config system. So you got to roll that back because you got to do that two separate, two separate deployments. So it's definitely, definitely going to, going to save you uh, from making a mistake. So our last step here, the CI pipeline will be your website. So we pass all our validators locally. We have gone through our code review, and Travis CI has said everything is great. When I merge my code into master or my, my default branch, my CI pipeline should automatically deploy uh, my code in a true CI CD setup to my production website. Uh, for John and I, both of our companies, uh, once that code is merged in and is deployed, we then have uh, some type of automated step. Uh, we use uh, Bash at Chromatic. Uh, Oomph uses uh, Ansible to handle this. But it's uh, uploading the files, importing configuration, running your database updates, running your entity updates, and then clearing cache at the end. 
And your developers don't need credentials into the production box. They don't need anything other than the fact that they just constantly know, I merged my code in, into master, and all of this has been taken care of for me. I don't have to think about it anymore. Um, and as John mentioned, the configuration read-only module enabled in production uh, prevents those surprises of someone, either the business team or another developer, going into production, making a config change, and then once I merge my code into master, that config change being blown away. Um, and then trying to figure out and scramble why something is broken. And uh, you know, the idea of CI, CD, and a great DevOps team um, is just improved site reliability and uptime. Not being able to worry about anything breaking and having automation in place just reduces the risk every time you make a change on a site. Because we all know uh, sites that we inherit maybe from other companies or, or walking into something that maybe you didn't build that's not in your workflow, we get kind of scared making changes because we're not, we don't fully understand why something was built the way it was. All right, at that point, we'd like to thank you for listening and uh, open the floor up to any questions that you guys may have. That corner. In what order do you run your import commands for the configuration? We've had several times experienced issues with running UpDB and config import in different uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so typically, um, what you want to do there is uh, you want to do your config import, make sure everything looks good, and then run your your up DB um, or your up, uh, ent up or whatever you know whatever you need to do. As Nate said, with the CI process that's all happening automatically in most cases. But yeah, if you're doing it locally, you definitely want to. Uh, typically, I'll actually clear cache, then run an import, and then do whatever the you know the next steps are. I don't. I just I let I let the automation happen. Uh, but yeah, so I, I, the problem is to say what is right or wrong in that, which one should go first, is that uh, modules that are contributed can actually create uh, configuration entities or configuration items programmatically in an in a install hook uh, or a, a updb or sorry, a hook update end. Um, so unless everybody's following best practices and those best practices may not just be defined anywhere. Um, it'd be hit or miss. But uh, I, ideally, as John said, it's config, db update, entity update. If, if you guys don't know what an entity update is, um, in Drupal 8, uh, the entity API allows you to change the schema or the uh, database table of the base entities. The only way to get those changes in is to run entity updates. Um, I found this not being very documented uh, very well in core on Drupal.org, and this really burned us when we started writing custom entities for one of our clients. Um, and we, adapt, we added it to our workflow, and if you haven't, even if you don't write custom entities, just do, because your contrib modules may. Uh, uh, Patrick. Yeah, is the assumption that uh, big read only is always on, you cannot make changes, no one can make changes to the web? Yeah. Um, you ever turn that off? And CI. No, because sometimes you, there are changes that happen that you may not necessarily know about. Um, you know, modules like uh, XML sitemap can sometimes write con, uh, write config, um, and then you know there are certain things like we actually had a client that was going in and um, editing meta tags, like meta tag configuration, and then for like at least two deploys, they're like, "Oh, this disappeared. What happened?" And I'm like. I'm like, oh, I don't know. Like, we'll do it. You know, do it again. And then, like on the second one, I'm like, hold on a second. And before we did a deployment, we looked at we looked at the config, and we're like, here's the problem. Like, the, all these things are being updated. So, you know, it definitely should always be enabled on uh, on production. Uh, obviously, you know, it might be a case by case basis depending on the client and what they're doing in, in house. But so I would recommend it. Do you have them go to the test site and make that config change, or do you not allow them to make that? Typically, we don't want them to do it because the config needs to be stored in the repository and they may not have access to the repository. That's why I kind of say it's case by case. You know, if, if you're working with a, a team that has um, access to the repository and they're making those changes, then you know, it, it may change the dynamic a little bit. But typically, our clients are not in the repo making those changes. And you always want to make sure that stuff's ba uh, backed up in code. I, I typically think that the structure uh, structure tab and the configuration tab in the admin toolbar, I just don't give that to clients. Uh, 
Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's opinionated. I I know, but uh, in my in my opinion, it's one of the least user-friendly UIs in Drupal for those two areas, uh, as well as the most dangerous to the client. So yeah. I usually take the uh, Spider-Man approach. With great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> uh, yes. Yep. Um, all these of you mentioned this already, but the configurability module, can you like blacklist configuration so that it's allowed to be modified through the UI? <laughs> I don't know. This is funny. Uh, so Julie, what, what do you remember off we ran into this? Uh, solar, that's what it is. So patch, so the yeah. solar module, oh, thanks Julie, she gave it to me. Uh, so the solar, solar module, um, there is a bug with read only, and I don't think you can whitelist. And the reason why I'm gonna give this example is, so a, a patch of solar, if you go into the UI and you want to re-index everything, that page is considered configuration. The configuration read only won't let you re-index because it's through the config UI. Um, well, I never actually, you know, deeper into that, so I just ran the drush command on the server. Um, but that's something to think about. Again, like there is a huge caveat using this. It's, it's like yeah. it, it is dangerous in the sense of like there may be some undesired consequences to your workflow. Um, so, so, <coughs> so the short answer that's, is that's, no. That's too bad because I don't think these can fit ignore. I actually have a great model. Yeah. Uh, especially when you're doing multi-site platform development. Um, that would be a killer feature to have because I do. Look, I have to let my clients go into that admin interface to modify some things. Sure. Um, so, but everything else I don't want them to touch. Yeah. And yeah, the combination of configuring more with config read only. Just yeah. It's uh again this this is opinionated to what's worked for us. Um, I think the takeaway is if you haven't heard about any something in this. Hopefully like you learn something, you can take it back and add it to your workflow. Um, you know, uh, Chromatic works with a lot of different companies and we embed ourselves in the different teams. So what I'm talking about here is not the, the rule. It's probably the exception to the perfect scenario that we're not integrated into a, into a large company and they're not dictating our workflow. Um, on the other hand, like oomph, actually has the luxury of not embedding themselves in a lot of teams and they can actually dictate a lot of that workflow. Um, so yeah. Uh, Jeff? If, if the developers have some base content, like the block content or maybe a reference table, things like that, how do you convey that as part of the continuous deployment? So it's not included in config, right? So content's not typically not typically included in that in that uh, workflow, right? So that's very much development config file workflow. If you're moving, um, if you have to move content from site to site, um, you're doing that manually, or um, I mean, you can develop you can develop your own scripts to be able to do that. But um, in this workflow, that's that piece of it is not is not there. So if you have Block content, and you make a change to it. You have to manually make that edit on the production machine. Yep. Typically, I mean, typically for for us, and I'm sure this applies to Nate too. Like, we're not doing a ton of content entry. That's all being done on the production server by the client. So we're we're following the you know the Pantheon best practice of like, oh, pulling down content the the content to our local to work with, and then pushing up the code and the config to the production environment. And you just pull it down by cloning the database. Um, yeah. So we both both in, in Chromatic, we don't make production config changes unless I have the latest production database. So I, I, I will never. I'll, I, that's, I I learned the hard way. I'll, I'll never do that again. Which is I'll, I'll never pull a dev database and export my my production config and push out because you'll reference the wrong piece of content in your config. Go ahead. Uh, oh, content, sorry, sorry. Content. If you want to migrate content between sites, talk to the guys <coughs> with the uh, Drupal team at Pfizer. They've done a lot of it, uh, look, stuff you know, on that area. So, okay. Uh, Olson, Greg Olson is the, the lead on that. So, okay. Good to know. Um, so without 
configuration installer? You have kind of a chicken and egg thing with the configuration going upstream and no site ID without a site installed at production. Um, so like, I assume you have to start off with the site at production, pull down the, the site UUID to be able to push back up again. Um, but I was curious, like, with that in mind, like, does the configuration split enable you to split up a site UUID as well for? So. I, that's a really good question. So to be clear, every environment, so John and I were struggling with this when we wrote this talk, which is we were going back and forth and saying, we didn't want to say the word site, we didn't want to say the word environment in the wrong, the wrong context. So when we say site, we mean like, you know, Rhode Island College or whatever it is, or dot edu. Um, that site may have five different environments. They all share the same site in UID. They don't change. So my production, my staging, my debt, those are always going to be the same. Um, what, what we mean in like big and solid with the site UUID, it's just really good for like uh, local development, I guess. Uh, if you want to just like spin up the site without importing the database, you can spin up a working site. Like uh, I worked with Julie on a project um, for like five months, and it was me and three, two other developers. We didn't even pass a database for five months. We just used config installer as a local development environment and used the bell generate. And we just didn't, yeah. yeah. Um, can I ask one more question? Um, so one of the things that you said is, um, when you talked about like the continuous integration pipeline was that you were saved in cases where you had like ripped out some, um, ripped out some configuration without removing, or removing the module without removing the configuration or something. If you're using um, config installer, um, I'm confused like how if you're using config installer and using develop generate or whatever, like how does it actually detect that? Like if you if the module's missing? So well if you took away the configuration well I guess uh, so I it think like there's something that would yeah, I think be happen happening in steps where you take yeah, the I think I know what you're kinda take away the module. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's kind of a workflow thing, right? So in, in our workflow, uh, we're using Composer to uh, install or, or download our modules, mm -hmm. and then in Drupal, there's actually a core extensions YAML file that mm -hmm. lists all the modules that are enabled, right. um, and then each module may have configuration. Uh, the workflow to remove a module is typically disable the module from Drupal. Export your configuration so the d the deletions of the configuration for that module are in your repo. Um, push that up to your environments, and then in a separate commit later on, re do a composer remove to remove the module. Because what ends up happening is you go through your CI process. It doesn't install the module, but then there's config for the module, and it says, "Whoa, whoa I can't do anything with this config because the module doesn't exist in the file directory." So remove the, remove the config, disable the module, one commit, do another commit to remove the module from the composer of JSON file. Talk about a true life story. That was like a, that was an Easter egg for us when we like first started doing this workflow. We were like trying to uninstall it, we're trying to remove the config, remove it in the, the module from the composer in the same same uh, PR. We push up and we're like, what is happening? And and it's, it's, I will say that uh, you know config import, uh, configuration system is nice enough to give you an error message that says like, hey, I can't install this config because I'm looking for this module and it doesn't exist. So that's where, that's where Travis kind of saves you because it's running the, it's running the config import for you, uh, you know, before you deploy. And it's saying like, oh, I can't do this. And then you, have, you know, oh, I didn't do this right. I gotta go back and change it. Well, that's the part I don't understand. Doesn't win config installer actually be installing without the module? No, because the, the, the module is in the composer file. It's in your composer JSON file. Right, but no, if you took both out at the same time, like. No, it, he, he's making it, it's, so you're correct, yeah. Because you're installing a brand new site, it wouldn't necessarily error out in that situation. Right. You would right. actually yeah. catch that, probably pushing to a dev or a UAT or fraud. That's, again, when, when we said that this config system isn't perfect, it isn't. Uh, the dependency hell that we run into with composer or <coughs> management is what it is, it is health. Um, your more complex integrations with maybe a distribution called Lightning, uh, you may run into this. <laughs> I know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, um, it's, uh, uh, 
All we can really do is share our experiences. We really haven't found uh, a, a, a catch-all for everything because the system is so ex extensible. It allows you to have so many different types of workflow that really just is no, uh, there's no way to say like, how to do something correctly, I guess. Just kind of pick what works for you. Are there any other questions? I'm just curious, so when you're, you have different developers working on the same project, do they have their own, do you think split, do they actually have their own split for, their, for each developer? Nope. Everybody's working on uh, the same the same splits, the same code base, um, and then Git's basically handling the merges and, and the rebases and all that stuff. So um, I will say it's not overly typical that we have like two developers working on the same exact thing, but um, either way, Git's going to prevent a, uh, a conflict there and going to say, hey, you got to look at this and, and fix it before we can actually do anything else. And you, um, so I've had this issue with uh, one developer, and we kind of figured out the wrong thing, but you know, we've got two people working on the, on the same site. Um, I'm making a, a mo adding a module, updating the PK, push it up, and then they need to get that into, they need to get that, pull that down, but they've made some config stuff. Mm -hmm. So right now we just, do you have like a process for that? Right now they just, because of course they I mean, pull it down, they, they import the config, it works over Yeah, I mean, it, it's essentially a Git issue, right? So like what they should be doing is, um, if they know that you made a change and it's been pushed into master, they should be uh, checking out master and then doing a rebase on their branch and then just basically dealing with the, the conflict to see like, okay, he edited the same thing I edited, what config is necessary or, or not. You're missing a step though. And I think the step is every time I start a feature branch, um, I import my config in every single time. So every time I start a new right. feature or I start a new new ticket in, in whatever ticket management system I'm doing, using, um, I import config. Yep. Now, again, it's not perfect. <laughs> if I'm in this massive feature branch I've been working on for three weeks uh, and I've had config changes by other team members, um, at that point, I think it's not a config issue, it's not a Git issue, it is a process issue at your company. You should not be working on features that last three weeks. You should be working on features that can be broken down into days. Um, so you're not carrying this, this major divergent branch that needs to be merged in. Um, and it's, again, it's gonna be a dependency help. Um, so try to break your stuff up into smaller pieces of work and this workflow will work pretty well for you. Yeah, I agree with Nate. I, you know, I think our our workflow, or my workflow, is typically that, um, you know, I cut a new feature branch, I do a, a cache rebuild and an import right then and there, and then I start doing my work. And I know that, okay, I'm at least up to date with the config that's in master. So it makes it a little bit easier when it if comes to... Okay, if you're making your you made config locally, and you know that somebody's already pushed a, another config up, then you'll export that config first? So, so when you pull it... You yeah, I mean, I would, do, I would do whatever I'm doing locally. I would export that config, and then that's where it becomes a Git, Git problem, and you're going you're gonna to deal with the, the uh, configuration. Um, configuration yeah. Merge. merge, merge conflict. Thank you. Um, right there. So we have five more minutes. Um, I have one question for you. Yeah. Once, once you have a big team, have large features that span longer time than actually they should. You very quickly get into the habit of pulling down what's there was introduction very often, importing as you go on, so that you don't have the issue of hey, I just worked with this for four weeks, and now I can't get. Push anywhere because Especially with something like a view, like views config can get kind of gnarly and, config <laughs> and confusing, and doing a trying to resolve that conflict. I will say, when we first started using configuration manager workflow without a split, um, I can can't even count on my hands how many times we would get into full blown arguments with each other over writing each other's config and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, getting getting frustrated at each other because this was a brand new workflow for us. Uh, so again, if you're not using this, like, don't be the person that can make decisions and just implement it. You definitely talk with the team, and you have to have process before you start using something like this. Yeah, they're definitely going to be growing pants, um, and they're you got to you got to figure out what works for your team. That's why we're you know we start off by saying it's not like a one stop solution for everybody. Yeah. Any other questions before we wrap up? No. Good. 
You guys enjoy the rest cool. of the conference. Thank you.